All right, everybody, we're back. Best Tool Shop Talk. We just recorded number 25, and it's with a great personality. His name is Drew Witt with two T's. It's, I always say this, it's a must listen, and I think it's our longest shop talk to date. So we're back and we're recording. Hey everybody, this is Drew Witt. <laughs> uh, he is on YouTube at Witworks. Make sure you put two T's in there. And he's on Instagram at Wit underscore works. And then he has another YouTube channel, which I found. It's it's called Drew Wit. There's a space, yeah. right? It's so creative, yes. I, oh, I was no, running no. out of ideas. <laughs> no, 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 no. But it, when I first started watching that channel, um, I, I had to figure it out. And then I figured out what you were doing with that channel. And um, but it was called something else, right? Yes, it was a dumb idea. I thought. I was watching people start second channels and I can explain why if you want, but um, and they were putting their name and then plus or. You know, because like Disney Plus, ESPN Plus, oh. and it seemed like everybody had a Plus or a Max or an Ultra. So I thought I'd be cute, and it wasn't. It was stupid, and I I called it Witworks Plus Max Ultra. I just put them all on there. It was funny for like the first ten minutes, and then I got tired of it, so I eventually just changed it to my name. Okay. And I'll probably change it again. I don't know. It's oh, that was worth me coming to Shop Talk to talk with you today because I was trying to figure out why the heck you said plus max, whatever. Plus max ultra, yeah. And see, that's the thing. It's it, it was funny in my head, but it just didn't translate to people. Some people wanted cool. me to call it Twitworks. I thought that would be too confusing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted to call it what? Twitworks? They want so my channel is Witworks. They wanted me to call my second channel Twit with a T. Oh my goodness. Twitworks or worse. Works. <laughs> so oh my god. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Moving right along. <laughs> Moving right along. Sorry. Oh. oh no, no worries. Hey, um this is something that some uh you ever stand up somewhere and someone says, Hey, tell us a little bit about yourself, and you go. I always like think, what do you want me to say? I was on a podcast here in Boone County and they say, they asked me, hey, uh, what do you do? Or tell us a little bit about yourself. And I was like, there was a pause there. So I'm going to ask you, tell us a little bit about yourself. How would you get started to do what you're doing? Have you? How long have you been doing this? And give us a little background on yourself, Drew. Yeah, I'm the youngest of five kids. and. Um, my earliest memory, true story, is riding in the car, seeing a billboard, and then when I got home, I got my crayons, and I recreated the billboard, and I started drawing. And I was doing that, and my parents noticed that, and so they just started buying me, like, tons of art supplies and paint, and they, they, um, there was a lady that we knew that was really good at teaching creative kids. And, and so from my earliest memories, I was always sketching out ideas that I had or that I saw and creating. And then in, I think in first grade, I built a robot. It wasn't a real robot. It was just a cardboard box. And the arms were the dryer vent hose, you know? Yeah. And uh, my uh, the, the movie uh, Johnny Five or Short Circuit, had come out short circuit yeah remember that and so i recreated johnny five with like the head was a was a tissue box and i used uh toilet paper rolls and it, 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 it was just like a cardboard mess but i had so much fun creating oh, yeah. this and that was kind of the early beginnings of me discovering that more than anything i'm a creator like, I don't care what the medium is, if it's 3D printing, if it's wood, if it's canvas and paint, um, if it's grass, if it's concrete, I just like to make things that look beautiful and that give joy to people who use them or see them. 
I've always, my earliest, that's just, I've always been that way. Um, and the, everything in my life has been through that filter of how can I make something and make it cool and make it beautiful, make it pleasing, make it work, make it bring life to people. So that, that's kind of at the core of who I am. That's the type of person I am, the creator that I am. Wow. And as I'm, cause I'm a very nosy person, as I look in the background, it transfers into music as well. Doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. I have a couple of guitars here and I, I was a drummer uh, first. So I, I started playing the drums in junior high. Then later in high school, I, I picked up the guitar and then I learned a little bit of the piano, started singing and um, found that what I really found with music, there's this quote that almost no one has ever heard. I think it's the most beautiful thing. Um, the Greeks viewed astronomy the study of the stars as the organization of external things. And they viewed music as the other side of that coin. And they viewed music as the organization of internal things. So what I, what I found in my childhood was as I was going through the hard times of teenage years and, and all of the, the different challenges we all have, Music helped me organize everything that was going on inside of me. And when a lot of my friends went down other roads of substances and other things to try to like cope and figure things out, I just went so deep into learning how to be the best drummer I could be, learning how to be the best guitarist I could be. And I didn't know at the time, but what was happening looking back was I was learning how to organize all of the stuff inside of me through music and it turns out that's just like the Greeks figured that out a long time ago. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, that's why I love music. Um, I don't make music, but I love music and that has, Oh my goodness gracious. You just taught something about me. Um, because there's certain times that I needed my music growing up to get me through some trying family times when I was a teenager as well. Yep. And the people who participated with me and the music that I liked going to shows, going just, you know, jamming and stuff. They're still my friends. In fact, we had a mass birthday party in Massachusetts. We all turned 60 this year and it was music. We figured out that brought us all together. And that's how we solved a lot of problems going through high school because we created a small community amongst ourselves and into college. Cause there was a person there who I met in college. That, oh my God. And the Greeks figured that out a long time ago. Oh, long time. Yeah. And there's, Wait, um, and, and there's a, I'm going to start probably marking, songs. Yeah. There's probably songs that you have heard or that you hear now. And in a moment, it brings you back to something or it, settles you down or mm -hmm. reminds you of your grandparents or whatever. That's the power of music, man. It's the organization of internal things. And that's really weird because I was lifting today and I put on a song by REM. This is so weird. Uh, Radio Fury Europe. It was their first tour of the album. I think there was a hundred people in the audience and my best friend and I were there. And every time we hear it, we send it to each other. And it's that memory of our friendship growing up and being at that show. Okay. Holy yeah. moly. Did I digress so okay. daggone quick. One thing. If there's any school administrators listening to this, do not cut the shop program or the music program. <laughs> you're, you're killing kids when you do that. And yet schools are doing that all over. They're cutting music. They're cutting shop. Please don't do that because it, it literally saved my life. Oh, yeah. And uh, oh, I, you can I go, go on and on and <laughs> on about the um, reluctance of resetting up some of these shops that I go through with some of the administrators of the Freeze Educational. It's it's so tough. We need those shop classes. We need those music classes. We need them. So I'm going to open this up because I got to tell everybody how I met you. And it was a couple years back and you wrote me an email. And I believe 
And you, in fact, you sent that to me. And correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was a Sunday night you sent it to me. I don't remember. Uh, it was September something. I don't remember. Yeah. It may, it may have been. It may have been a Sunday night. Yeah. And uh, was it a year ago, two years ago? It was a year ago. It was, a, it was 11 and a half months ago. Which is crazy. That's wild. I was scared and, uh, to send that. I was so scared to send it to you. Well, you know, I can't believe you were actually saying that. So I went and you sent it to me. And I, I want to describe this to everybody because it meant a lot to me. You were getting ready to do a, uh, a dust extraction video. And uh, what happened is you sent me, so you introduced yourself via the email and you went through the whole thing about um the whole thing about um all the different bullet points you were going to talk about in your video and i looked at that and the reason it meant a lot to me was here's a guy i'm meeting via email and you already know you already get it but i added something in there and i said the difference between i think it was and i didn't even go look this up to get ready for this but i think i mentioned you, I think you asked what's the difference between a shop vac and a dust extractor. And I told you, and I go, that is something that I think is key that people should know. A dust extractor catches it at its source, a shop vac after the fact that you've made the mess. So then I went, I hope this helps. I'm just kidding. And, and when I sent that out, you released the video, I think, within the week. And I watched it. And I went, oh, I hope he gets some views. Holy moly. That's what exploded you, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And it was actually, that was going to be my last video. Because oh. at that point, I was doing, it was about a year and a half into YouTube. I, and I was putting my heart and soul and all this time into videos. And, and they were getting like, maybe sometimes 100 views. Sometimes a 1,000 views, which is a lot of people. But when you when you spend money and, and work really, really hard doing it the way I was doing it, and then you get 193 views, it's kind of deflating. And at some point, you were like, okay, this is not a good investment of my time. Um, and so that was, I was working on that video. I spent the entire month of September working on it. I, you know, self-funded it all, no sponsors. I bought everything. And I was just really... I just had this idea that like, it was going to flop. No one's going to watch this video. And I have a friend texted me and he said, Hey, how's the video coming? I was shooting some B roll for it. And I said, if this video tanks, I'm quitting. You know? And I, I was, I felt that way. And I had, I think 4,400 subscribers at that time. So, um, it's still a lot, but I think I just had unrealistic expectations. And that video got a hundred thousand views in the first week. Um, it's at seven hundred and thirty thousand views or something right now. It'll be a million views at some point. And I got so many people, um, like so many people, found me from that video. Like Jason Bent, uh, Cam Anderson, um, you know, Brad Rodriguez. Like all of like my heroes in the space. Um, they 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 commented on the video, and I was just blown away that all these people that I watch would have even seen or commented on this video. And that from from that moment, if you look at the graph, um, it's like this. And then when that video hit, it's been like this the last eleven year, eleven months, I guess, uh, ten ten months. Yeah. But yeah, they always say it just takes one video. Yeah. And I I feel like man, what if I would have quit? What if I would have not? I almost didn't publish the video because. I was afraid of all the comments I was going to get. Yeah. And um, I almost didn't, I thought about not publishing it, but I'm, I'm really glad I did because it changed my life. You know, um, I've seen people quit creating content. They're master carpenters, master trim carpenters, master furniture builders. And it kills me. It breaks my heart because they have so much to offer. But sometimes this vitriol commenting is uh, is too much for them. And I I say, yeah, you got to have a you got to have a uh, a tough skin, you know. And 
it's not that I respond a lot, but if I respond to something, I always say my new one, and I think I told you this one is um, 423-1911. You know, what you're doing is you're putting yourself out there. Like I've done on Festival Sedge all these years. I've put myself out there. And people comment sometimes. I go, oh, do they even understand what's coming out of there? You know, they're typing, they're texting and all that. It's built up and it hurts, but it shouldn't hurt you because they're not the man in the arena. You are. And I didn't mean to get heavy, but I want people to go watch that. Listening to this and I'm not going to spoil anything because what was said in 1911 is so true. And I may be misquoting that date, but it's Teddy Roosevelt, man in the arena. Everybody who is in, who is creating content out there should go see that. Now, I know, but I'd like to have you tell our audience, Drew, you're a very creative guy, but you were creating furniture pieces for people. And you're not just a YouTuber. You were into building stuff because of your creative. You were building for people, correct? That would ask? Yes, sir. Yeah, about, um, gosh, about 10 years ago, I was working out of a co-working space doing graphic design. And um, they had these $40 Ikea desks. It's the de- It's like you buy the white top and then you get four legs for $5 each. And it's like a cardboard. And so I'm sitting at this Ikea desk trying to do creative work. And it's like, I'm so uninspired with this desk, you know? Um, so I made my own desk. I got a friend to weld up a, a metal base and I made a wooden top and I screwed it to it and I brought it in. And what would happen is people would come into the office to hire me to make them a website or, or do a video or something. And by the end, they would actually say, actually, could you build me a desk? And so I accidentally got into building desks for people because I just built myself a desk. And a friend of mine, this was 2013, he said, you know, you should make videos about how you build these desks and then make plans and sell them. And I thought, why would I do that? Why would I show people how easy this stuff is? They'd never want to buy the desk from me. You know, are you kidding me? And so I didn't. And it wasn't until uh, 2020 with the pandemic that I discovered YouTube's a thing. Like I thought for all, I'm so dumb. I thought for all these years, YouTube was for cats and pornography. And I wasn't interested <laughs> And I wasn't interested in either of those. So it was like, why would I go on YouTube? I don't care about this stuff. And, and then I, during the pandemic, I discovered this, this guy named the Wood Whisper who started at the time that my friend told me to start and Steve Ramsey and, all, and, I, and Bob Claggett and Jimmy DeResta. And I thought, dang it, I'd probably have a million subscribers <laughs> if I would have done what I'm doing now 10 years ago when my friend told me. I'm just a fool and I had no idea that there would be such a demand for content or plans or things like that. Um, So yeah, for the last 10 years, I've been building stuff like that. Um, But it wasn't until the pandemic that I learned, oh, YouTube's a thing and you can actually like build a business doing this and um, get some, some bit of financial freedom and flexibility. That's still lots of work. Um, But it's, it's uh, nice being your own boss and not worrying about other other people affecting you, you know? So your main channel, um, of course, I've been there um, watching it over the, the time you've been doing it, since the CT Dust Extractor one uh, versus the other one. And I'm going to... I, I, cause Jason's a, Jason Bent's a good, good close friend of mine. And I always, I listen to what he says and he said, I could do a build video and get no views, or I could do a tool review and get a boatload of views. Could you describe that to me? So I understand it a little bit from your point of view. Yeah. So one of the reasons that kept me from growing for that first year and a half, was I was primarily doing how to and build videos. And I would spend like my favorite video that I did was I, uh, or two, two of them 
I built gifts for people that I officiated their wedding. I was a pastor for 20 years. And so what I would do is when, 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 I, when there was a couple in the church that got married, my wedding gift to them was I would build them something unique. And so the, the first video on my channel is me doing that. I recorded the ceremony and I took the vows of the bride and groom. I converted the audio into a, the waveform. I converted that into a vector and I CNC'd that into a piece of walnut with a sound, the, the sound wave of them saying their vows. And that was my, my wedding gift to them. It got a hundred views. Was that? It's super cool, but it got a hundred views. And so I would, I would do things like that, that were super creative and took a lot of work and like no one was interested. And then I accidentally did a, a, a track saw review and I had 25 subscribers and it got 30,000 views. And then I did a five, five accessories for your track saw video and it got like 20,000 views. And then I do a build video and it get a hundred views. And then I do a compare two vacuums and it gets 700,000 views. So at some point, you know, unless you're doing something crazy and expensive, like with a $3,000 slab and $2,000 of epoxy and it's super polarizing, or unless you're, you know, like, like you have, to, my opinion is for build videos to really get views, they have to be so absurd or so extreme or so polarizing. Because if I were to build, if I were to do a build video on a coffee table or a nice stand, like the, you've already seen those videos. <laughs> There's like yeah. nothing new to add to the conversation. Mm -hmm. And so there's so much content now that doesn't stand out and people are not 10 years ago that would have worked, but in 2023, that doesn't work because there's like billions and billions of minutes of content uploaded every day. You're just going to drown in a sea of mediocrity. Um, so the only way I did a build video earlier in the year and um, I actually didn't show, I actually didn't, what I did was I told the story of all of the mistakes that I made in the build video and that I sold it for an obscene amount of money. And it got, I think three or 400,000 views, but it was the story. And it was the, uh -huh. you, you sold a piece of pine for $3,000. That's what got mm -hmm. people's attention. It wasn't. And here's you do step one, step two. No one cares about that. It was the story. And, um, so I, I think that's the hard people complain a lot about YouTube being an infomercial. And I get that. However, stop clicking. <laughs> like, yeah, stop exactly. clicking. Stop watching. Stop giving your watch time if that's how you feel. The reality is I I could spend the month on a thing, get a hundred views, a track saw will come out, I'll pull it out of the box, I'll give my opinions. That video with a red tool. It's got 300,000 views in a week. I mean, you can't ignore. Like that's, no. that's filling up Cowboys Stadium in Arlington three times in Isn't a week crazy? to watch an idiot with a track saw. You know what? That is a great, <laughs> that's a great analogy. I love it. Wow. That makes too that's much sense. That's a lot of people. That's that a lot, is of, a people. lot of people. That's a lot of people. Or and even even um, I did a domino for dummies video, and I think it got fifty thousand views, and I was kind of disappointed that it didn't get more. But still, you know how many NFL stadiums hold fifty thousand people? And can yeah. you imagine if uh, if you know what you know? I was thinking of like the Raiders. Like, how much does their new stadium? Probably seventy thousand people, or hundred, or I, can you? I forget. But can you imagine? Look up Allegiant Stadium, up, Chris. Filling up half of Allegiant Stadium to have you break down the domino. You'd be nervous. Yeah, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. You know. Yeah, so. Derek is nervous every weekend there, isn't he? <laughs> Not anymore. Boy, I'm going to tell you, every time you say that, when I call out Derek from Las Vegas, they're 
we put Derek C from Las Vegas. I lose it, man. When I read it off the board, I go, I know who that it's, is. It's stupid because there's only two people in the world who get the, <laughs> get the joke and it's me I know. and you. <laughs> I know, but I think it's funny. It's like, so if everybody doesn't know, uh, or probably nobody knows, I've been an Oakland Raider fan since I was a child. Well, some people still think I'm a child, but what, since I was a little kid, how many people does it hold? 65,000. 65,000. Yeah. Yeah, you have, I mean, you, you so, have videos that have that. I mean, can you imagine doing that? Lots so, of snuts. So what I get a kick out of, because I think everybody who listens, my pride and joy is every Friday at noon, because I, I spend a good portion uh, of Thursday and part of Wednesday setting up for Festival Live that one hour. And it's really... It's a really good thing because Chris, Derek, and I all weekend, we track how many views and we type back and text each other. And we were blown away this past weekend because on the CSC SIS 50, we got, I think we woke up Monday morning, it was 8,000 views on it. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's so that's that's us doing our job and we're really proud of it. And we get a lot of views over the weekend. Usually the average, I think, is about 4,500 views. And sometimes and it's one of those things I talk about the new earbuds or I talk about uh, a battery pack or the, an energy set and Philip out of Canada goes, I, I, I cannot believe you talk about the energy set and get all those views. Well, it's because I incorporate everything else in cordless with Vestal in the video. So thank you for calling that out. I really appreciate yeah. it. The, so I'm going to call it out. The saw stop or a saw video. video. What happened? What are the ramifications of it? What, yeah, if you mind. don't mind talking about it, because I know it's water damage. It was it's interesting about that video. Um, is people accuse me of faking the thumbnail and photoshopping? Oh. I took the picture with my phone. It, it's that's a picture from my phone for the insurance company. That's what that is. Didn't doctor. That's it. crazy. It's just that. But we um. Yeah, earlier uh, last month, we, we've been in the process of selling our home and we want to move to be closer to our family. And um, we've been in this process for about a year looking. We finally found a place. We found like after a year, we're like, oh, this is the place. They accepted our offer. <laughs> so excited. We drove. It felt like the end of a season. We drove four hours on the highway with three kids in the car survived made it to our ho house to find water in the street and while we were gone that weekend a water line above my garage we had a, there was a, a studio apartment above it that we'd run out uh busted while we were gone no one was there and flooded the upstairs down and and like the table saw the saw stop took the hit like the water had come down and was hitting the saw stop and then going everywhere else for three days in a hundred degree heat high humidity it was it was pretty traumatic and the saw stop was six months old it was in perfect condition i babied this the, the top and uh that was that was the rust that had formed e even having protected the top um it was still there was just that much water and humidity for days oh. and then there's nothing that can stop that um yeah and there was like water in the cabinet um yeah it was just you know, i took off the rails the water was coming out of the road. It was, it was so heartbreaking. And so I, I figured uh, uh, the next day movers were coming to take it because they had, we had to gut the garage. So they took everything and I did not want it sitting in storage for upwards of a month or two with that rust. So I quickly try to restore it as quickly as I could. So I thought I'd make a video about it and it did well. Um, but I got a lot of, I, I discovered there were some comments on there the other day. There was like 124 people attacking me in a thread. Oh. Um, uh, you know, you grow up, quit whining, get back to work. And this was like not just a saw stop. It was a saw stop to the max. It was $6,000 of every bell and whistle, six months old. And uh, yeah, you don't just get over that. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's a lot of hard work. Um, so. So yeah. going going forward, bring us up to speed. What's happening now? Um, right now, uh, we sold our house. Someone was like, uh, came by to see it. They're like, oh, 
great. We get all new stuff in the garage. We don't care. It's like awesome. And we should close at the end of the month and be able to move next month. And um, so right now my shop is in, they're putting up insulation today. They started drywall yesterday. And, and there's like, the good news is we caught it pretty early. It wasn't a fire, you know, it's just mm-hmm. drywall and paint and flooring and trim. It's not rocket science. It's just $70,000. Um, oh, tell me, tell me you had insurance for that. We had, Yeah. Well, we had insurance, we had homeowner insurance, but um, we specifically, I don't remember doing this. This is the reason why you're watching shop talk is make sure that you are covered with water damage. We weren't, but I had added an additional policy for $2 a month that would specifically cover water damage caused by appliance failures and plumbing failures. My policy had excluded that. And so six years ago, I made the decision. I don't remember doing this to add that additional coverage on for $2 a month. And because of that, we're just out a very small deductible. But man, I I shudder at the thought of me trying to save $2 a month because I'd be staring down a $70,000 bill right now that I wouldn't be able to pay um, and and would be in just a world of hurt. So um, yeah, if if you get anything out of this, go check your your homeowner's insurance and make sure that there's no exclusions in there that are going to bite you. I'm checking it next week. <laughs> Too cool. Hey, um, I always ask this question. Um, who was first in woodworking? Who was, still is, or you want to emulate? Who's your influence in woodworking? Um, man, that's a fantastic question. I think. There's a, I have a lot of them, but I think Chris Salamone from Four Eyes would be oh, wow. the person that influences me and had influenced me the most. Um, obviously, his build, his his design and building capabilities, but I felt like as a content creator, he gave me a lot of permission to because he does very um cinematic but kind of chill video yeah. like he's not mr beast and he's just very creative and his use of music and his writing and his sarcasm is so great and i was like oh you can do that on youtube and so i've been in, inspired and influenced a lot um and try to take it in my own direction but i love that i love I, I learn everything. I learn something every time I watch his videos. So he'd be probably the most dominant. Um, but yeah, the, probably the most dominant. Uh, okay. Person. So let's take it to another step. Who is your biggest? I know my, my least for, influence, J- Jason Bent is the, is the least. Yeah, mine as well. I'm kidding. <laughs> he's going to listen to this. And he's gonna, he goes, I'm waiting for them to drop that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my goodness gracious uh we had him he was our second festival shop talk wasn't he we had so many daggone hiccups when we had him i have to have him on of again. course, of course. Mean, we, uh, no, you, no you don't you don't have to yeah i know but he's just he's a wealth of knowledge hey i got in the, i got okay so when it comes to influences how about in not not just woodworking but are there other people in content creation that some of their uh channels really jazz you and you have to watch them to get oh man gosh yeah like a hundred i have a hundred yeah you know, I just discovered one that I really like. Um, I'm probably late to the party, but Drew Builds. Drew Builds Stuff is the name of the channel. Have you seen him? Yes, I have. And I I, I know I have it um, as one of my subs, my subscriptions. Um, yeah. Uh, Drew, uh, Keith Johnson. I learned a lot yeah. Um, yeah. from Keith. Uh, Bourbon Moth, obviously. And you had asked me non non woodworking, and I gave you woodworking examples. I'm sorry. Um, there's two that I would say. One is Colin and Samir. They're a creator. They like speak to creators for on YouTube. Yep. 
about the business. I love them. And then yep. one of my favorites is uh, Gerald Undone and Make Art Now. They're like camera nerds. And they're awesome. Uh, Make Art Now especially. Uh, his He's a filmmaker. And all of his videos are... He just makes the craziest stuff out of technology and cameras. And so I... I always get inspired by those guys, even if I don't need to learn, like and I'm not interested in a new camera, I'm good, but I will watch them just do. When you create content, it makes you, it takes you to that ultra analytical uh, vibe when I'm watching videos uh, or a content that doesn't have to do with woodworking. Like I, I think it's not news to anybody, but I like lifting, lifting weights. And I see how people create videos about lifting weights. And I'm like, yeah, they're leaving a lot out <laughs> there, you know, and some of their editing, they could use a good editor like the unit, you know, but it's kind of, he's laughing over here, <laughs> but he's, yeah, he's my right hand man. He always has been. And, uh, but it's, uh, you get really analytical on how it's edited. And that's what I think I pick up from watching not woodworking videos, but other content out there. Okay. So here's one more about influences in life. Who has been one of the biggest influences in your life? Oh my goodness. And that, that I know I'm dropping that one on you. I'm going to have to masticate a, chew on that one, man. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on. And then you can think okay. about it. Okay, so was that one of the words that you had to uh, use, masticate? <laughs> you got it. <laughs> yeah, baby. You got you it. You got them written down. I knew it. <laughs> you do, yeah. Just, you see? You know. but, he, but he also let me know what it meant. <laughs> to chew. Masticate. To chew. I thought I was going to slip that one right by you, but you... I, the problem is I let you in on the strategery of what I was going to do earlier. Oh, 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 oh. There's another word. Oh, gosh. Did you're you just being a, you're being a curmudgeon. Oh, oh yeah, no, no, I I knew that's in there too, but I am a curmudgeon. <laughs> okay. Uh, I know you take a long time because we've discussed this before, and you've run ideas by me, and I've never seen a video on them. And for me, uh, I'm a I'm a live guy. I like doing stuff live. This is like I said, this is the first podcast. We're not doing live on Instagram shop talk. And I'm kind of digging this format, huh, Chris? It's pretty good. Chris is like my you young Jamie. Uh, no, yeah. young Jamie on uh, Rogan. <laughs> He's looking stuff up to, for me. And I'm kind of I'm kind of kind of digging this. Hey, um I like this <clears throat> format. I like I'm like Ted yeah. Lasso. I'm a believer. I'm good. Yeah. No. <laughs> describe you're not right describe you are just not right describe to me the process i always call this and when i'm building something mm, that's my design i call it going from the alpha to the omega so the alpha would be hey i have an idea I, I don't want to take too much, but can you give a quick process on how you get to the final, like the posting of something on YouTube? You have an idea about something? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's slow, like a tortoise. Yeah. But uh, is another word. Um, Did he say tortoise? I said tortoise. Nice. Someone That's told it. me to say the word tortoise in the scene, so I still got a couple of more uh, to work in, but. It's really hard. It's uh, it's so distracting. I apologize to anyone annoyed right now. It's the dumbest. I I just regret this. Okay, back to your question. Sometimes I will get a random idea. It just pops in and I'll like write it down. And the mistakes that I have made is then I will immediately go to try to produce that. What often happens is it's hit or miss with the audience. And so what I have learned is to really test whether that's an idea that's worthy of putting in the effort for YouTube. Gotcha. So I have a list of maybe 25 video ideas that I keep. And there's some that like, I don't know, that's probably like a thousand, big, thousand view idea. I have one that is i think a million view idea but it's going to take some money and some time and probably like two months to do 
And so I'm wow. like, oh, working up to it. But no one's ever done this video. Like this video has never been done by anyone in the world. I promise you. Hmm. And I think, I think it'll get a million views because no one, no one's dumb enough to do it. <laughs> you want to know what it is. You got to chuck a lot of uh, the unit. <laughs> you want to know? I'm not going to tell you what it is. No, I mean, I'm not like, tell anybody because I when I tell. <laughs> when I tell people sometimes I have an idea, the next thing I know they're doing it or it comes out somewhere. It's kind of like one of those things like, yeah, you said, hey, I thought of that invention years ago and now it's on, you know, Ronco or whatever. So I, I, I'll just what I'm learning to do is to test my ideas. And, and specifically, um, I built relationships with a lot of my audience members that are like core super fans. I actually like they have my cell phone number. I have theirs and I'll, I'll like run ideas by them. Go, Hey, what do you, what do you think about this? Tell me the truth. Don't, don't worry about my feelings. Um, once that gets, um, past once I come, when, when I have proven that that idea would resonate with enough of my audience, then it's worth my time putting in a lot of the effort that I'll do. Um, and from that point, I will then, like a good YouTuber, think of how do I visualize this in a thumbnail? And if, like, the rule is if you can't package that in a thumbnail, it's not worth making the video on because people probably aren't going to click on it. That's just the business of you. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. But that is huh. like, like the, the brilliant thing about the saw stop thing that you talked about. You brought up the thumbnail. And yep. it was because the image of everyone's dream table saw ruined gets you, right? Yeah. So I, I had a pretty good sense that that video would do well just because of that image alone. It didn't really matter what I did in the video. That image was going to get people's attention. Um, and so I'll then move into how do I package it? What could the th title or thumbnail be? And then I'll try to, I'll just like make the video. And then I'll come in on the after side of that on the back end and try to create a trailer that is 15 to 30 seconds that opens a bunch of curiosity loops and like plants a lot of questions that would make you want to watch continue to watch the video and then i will slowly answer those questions along the way and that's that's really i it, it you know it's inside baseball but what i've learned the hard way is that's how youtube works Yep. Can you get people to click? Can you keep them watching for a good percentage of the video? That's all YouTube cares about. Um, and what I what I learned was when sometimes I would do that accidentally and those videos would take off. So I just learned to, to like strategically or to use some strategy to do that on the front end and to not accidentally get a, a good video. And so I look back at some of my early videos and the videos that got a hundred thousand views whenever I had a hundred subs, that's what I did. I just did it accidentally. I didn't know I was doing it. Wow. Um, and then the videos that I love doing that got a hundred views. I'm like, well, that idea didn't really resonate with people. And I, the thumbnail and title didn't really resonate. It doesn't matter what I did in the video. Uh, it doesn't matter how cool the execution was you know, the title and thumbnail didn't appeal to people. So we wouldn't watch it. Huh. So I hate that for the record. I hate that. That's a thing. I know, but, but it's but what, the, it's, it's what it thing, is. Though. It's, it yeah, is it's, what it's, it is. It's, it's, it's good. You got to get the catch to get them and you got to keep them watching. Hey, uh, so I don't know, but enlighten me, you know, that dust extractor video you did with a CT, uh and the other one and that got uh seven hundred thousand views was that your first best tool yes yeah it was huh it was that was my first festival purchase um i don't know why i'm, I'm not sure why i picked that one um it's the core of the system yeah, I think it was, I, I don't know why I was drawn to the vacuum for some reason, but I, 
I went into the first time I saw Festool was at a Woodcraft. I never heard. I never. I was in a wood. I was in Woodcraft and like, who's this brand? Like, why do they have their own setup? And you know. And I saw the sander and I saw the price and I was like, are you kidding me? And, you know, they tried to explain it to me, but I was in that stage of just being this, you know, crusty old person because I'm, I'm conditioned. Sander should cost a hundred dollars, you know? And then after a couple of trips, I saw the, the vacuum and I was like, well, and so they let me just play with it. And I was like, Oh man, it's quiet. Oh, you can turn it on with Bluetooth. Oh, the, Hose garage. My favorite thing was the hose garage because what I hated about my shot back is you got to wrap the hose around the thing. And my, to me, I may have spent six hundred dollars on the CT Mini just because it had a hose garage. I'm not. I'm not embarrassed to admit how foolish I am. Like I liked that I could hide the hose. <laughs> that was my selling point. And I was gonna get it, and then the end of the year was coming, and there was a, a price increase, and so I thought there's probably I'm probably gonna buy this next year. I should probably buy it now. And then after I bought it and I realized, oh my goodness, the quality. I mean, just, I never looked at the other brands the same again. It was just one of those things. People say it. And I know I'm on a festival show, but like, you just have to use it to get it. And then I went in, I went in, um, Woodcraft to buy a sander and I was prepared to buy the uh an ec 150 or ets ec 150 whatever like this 500 dollars 600 dollars so, uh, yeah. thing and the the worker talked me out of it he said you should get this um the 125 it's uh 200 dollars i forget the it's the ETS 125 REQ. Yep. That's it. Yep. So I, I ended up getting that one. I was like, oh, you're talking me out of spending the next $300. So I got that. I put some mesh paper on it and I sanded with my CT MIDI. And for the first time in my life, I enjoyed sanding and there was no sawdust. And I about flipped out. And I was like, and my hand wasn't tingling. Yep. And then I thought, but if I put a little bit of pressure on that sander, it would not move. And I realized this is really like a light duty finish sander. Um, and so I was doing a, a desk build earlier this year and I needed a better sander. So I was going to get the, the 155, the, the e is it the EC? Is that it? Yeah. Is it the, the low profile one? Low profile. Yeah. That's the ETS EC 150 slash five. There you yep. go. I was gonna get that one, but they were at you guys. You know, like there was none in the world to buy apparently. So I got the three millimeter, mm -hmm. and then about two weeks later, the five millimeter was in stock. So I was like, I'll just buy the five millimeter. I haven't used a three yet. I'll return it. And by the time I got around to returning the three millimeter, I was one day out of my return window. And so now I have a 153, a 155, and then the earlier ones. And I have three sanders that I bought. And man, it is incredible. I don't have a Rotex yet. I, I want to get a Rotex soon. Um, but that's my favorite out of all the stuff that I use. That sander and the vac, the this extractor, I probably use that the most and enjoy that the most. It's, it is a game changer because I hate standing and I hate the mess, the standing and I hate how my hand would tingle. Yeah. But with y'all's products, my hand doesn't tingle. It's not a mess. I'm, I'm healthy. I'm safe. I get a perfect flawless finish. It's just, it just sucks that we've been conditioned to like, well, you should just have a hundred dollar tool. And it's like, yeah, if you're sanding a two by four, but if you yeah. want to do good furniture, like you need a better tool if you're going to do better work. It's just the way it is. Um, hmm. And then y'all cert the service y'all give for it. I mean, I I made the mistake of uh, of uh, messing it up, and you guys took care of me, you know. And uh, I appreciate it, you know. And the warranty, like I read the fine, I read like the warranty the other day. I, I had to register a new tool, and I never read the warranty. I just knew there was a warranty, and I was like, three years. Oh yeah wear and tear 
you cover shipping to and from? Are you kidding me? I didn't know that until like two weeks ago. You did it? No. I mean, I knew there was a good warranty, but I didn't read the terms. I I don't read the terms. I want to I want to make a note of this. And Chris, let's make sure we keep this in the podcast, because I think I finally met the person who's read our warranty correctly. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) and 10 year parts guarantee and a 30 day money back. guarantee. I I mean, holy moly. I don't mean that. Like, this is not me buttering you up. Like, I, I, I have a video coming out Friday on the TS60. And I mentioned this. Oh, cool. Name me a tool company that offers that. Good luck. Good yeah, luck. Like, y'all are crazy. <laughs> y'all are do you know crazy. Fine, do you know what the fine print is that nobody reads? Is and you'll see this in a lot of warranties out there with other manufacturers. They say, Hey, it's got a some say, I we got a five year warranty, or we got a six year warranty. But the fine print is as long as it's not used commercially or in an industrial setting oh, wow. where ours yeah. have none of that wording, you can use it and wherever you want to use it in whatever situation you have an ironclad three year warranty. It's pretty wild. I didn't want to well, yeah. get off on that yeah. too much. And well, and drill. my understanding is your primary target is professional carpenters, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> of course, Remodelers, yeah. painters, yep, furniture yeah. builders. Hey, I have a question. <laughs> this is not really a festival question, but it is because I, I just want to let the audience know. I met you first time via email, second time via phone call. I was in Bent's uh, truck and he was picking me up with a flat tire. And then we spoke. And then I think it was a couple more emails and you came up here for our uh, February 8th launch of the new product. Now, what I want to also make sure that's understood is you released a video afterwards, but it wasn't on the um, your number one YouTube channel. It was on a number two, you know, the plus ultra one. and. Before I let you start talking about the event, Drew, because people who don't understand us or some people who do understand us, that video was from you and it's people who understand us. And what was amazing was that video was released by our CEO internally here, but it also made it over to Europe and everybody on the boards there and everybody and Festool HQ saw that video. So one, I want to thank you. And two, could you just give me a brief overview of that story? Because it was really cool. And that's when I first met you in person too. So I was pretty stoked about that. Yeah, that was, I did not expect that video to really get that much attention. Um, Man, I think it got 18,000 views, which on my secret channel is unbelievable. Um, Yeah. So, Jason had invited me up or put me on the list or like somehow somebody at Festival USA made a mistake and they invited me to this event. (laughs) I don't know who it was. I don't want to jeopardize their job, but they invited me and I'm looking around at all of these people at this event and you would have to add a zero to my follower account to even get close to where some of these people are. I think I had 20,000 subscribers at the time and everyone else is like 200 and up, some in the millions. Uh, Dusty Lumber is there, like the best of the best and Jason Bent and me are there. You see what I did there? Okay. Yes. So we're, <laughs> we're there. You know, you could call him a Velociraptor or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Velociraptor. It, it's uh, the best of the best. Jason Bent, me and a Velociraptor. So we're we're there at the event, and I I am like I feel like Charlie in the Chocolate Factory, you know, um, like the poor kid who who shouldn't even be here. And um, I'm I'm at this event. We go up to the top where all the products are and the food and drinks are, and everyone immediately goes to party. And, um, not par- party. What I mean is like, they're just catching up. They all know each other. I had never met anyone in person at this time. I'm the new guy. 
I had imposter syndrome. Like, why am I here? I only have 20,000 subscribers on YouTube. No one knows who I am. Somebody made a mistake inviting me. And so I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm an extrovert, but I'm also shy in those situations. So I'm like in the back corner, just kind of like, okay, let me check out this uh, cordless capex, you know, and everyone else is laughing, having a good time. And, and, and to be fair, they were all nice to me. It just, I was the new kid and I didn't know any of the relationships or the inside jokes. And I was just kind of feeling on the outside. And so this guy comes up to me and starts talking to me. I don't know him. And in my head, I'm thinking, is he an influencer? Does he work with the setup team? And I thought, because there was a really good like support team around, like making sure there was enough food. And I, and I kind of thought he was with um, that crew. And we start talking and, you know, I, I asked him what his name was. And he said his name was Clint. And I said, do you work here? At, um, and he goes, yeah. And I said, what, what do you do? And I'm expecting him to say, I'm on like the marketing team or I'm here with the food. And he's, I'm the CEO. <laughs> and I realized <laughs> the CEO of Festival USA just like walked up and started talking to me. And we talked for maybe an hour. And we had some things in common. And he like legitimately like took an interest in me. And I'm nobody. And that night, he sent me an email. At like 11 p.m. thanking me for coming and that he was it wasn't a stock like it was a personal note to me and um i was in the hotel that night i was flying out the next morning i didn't know anybody really that well everyone was like going and doing things going out to eat or hanging out or whatever and i was just in my hotel room by myself and i was just struck with this overwhelming feeling that I had gotten it all wrong about Festool, that I had thought from that first moment that I saw the sander at Woodcraft, I thought greedy corporation just trying to take advantage of people. And then I visit and I see the family atmosphere. I see you ask people how long you've been here, 15 years, 16 years, 20 years, their pets are walking around. And it's like so cliche, but it was like, this is a family. I'm a design guy. So like seeing the natural light, seeing that the warehouse was air conditioned, seeing that there's like one shift of worker and just seeing like the respect that everyone has for each other, whether you're working in the front office or whether you're running a forklift, it just, it seemed like everyone had dignity. Really the thing that, that meant the most to me was you talking about your coworker that y'all named the service center after and like you breaking down crying in front of everybody. And I'm looking at you like, man, this guy's jacked full of testosterone. And then how you guys honored, like how you guys honored this, this, I, I don't want to mention his name just for his family and protect it. But like, I'll just, I'll just say Lester cause he is an icon here. There you go. How you honored Lester outside of that room and how you named it and how you spoke and how it, and like the whole tour was real, like sedge vibe, happy, fun. And then you talked about Lester and it was like silence. Yeah. I think can I, I can't it help. It was amazing. That. It, I can't help that. Uh, no, it was good. I I, I, wa I walked away from fine. there. And I just I got I got choked up, but I walked away from there, and I I I shouldn't have gone down that tangent of that line because it was supposed to be an upbeat evening, and I felt no. a little awkward. But whenever I give a tour of that facility, I talk about him because he meant so much to us here. And I always say this, and I'm not going to get choked up about this, but I always say this: if you have a very good friend out there don't ever forget to tell them you love them because i said goodbye to him hey i'll see you tomorrow and he was gone the next morning and i'll leave it at that and i'm going to tell you i it it rocked us i think for god a year here because he was so he he was so well loved here i think he knew that but you never know what's going to happen to somebody on the way home or, right. yeah. you know, his, I don't know the whole, all the details, but that's, that was my friend. And, and when you called that out, I was just like, I hope people take this right. Because 
you know, we spend the majority of our day here in the office. If you have a, a job, which I do, I call it my career. I call it my love of my life. And uh, I think I think that comes out sometimes. It's so clear. And I don't, Brian, I don't think it was a mistake. I, I think, and I know it wasn't contrived. There, there were people who commented on that video and they, they said, oh, that was all drama and fake and, and theatrics. And here's the deal. I spent 20 years as a pastor. No one in this world is lied to more than policemen and pastors. <laughs> I have a good BS radar. I've got two decades of, of discerning when people are BSing me. And, I, and to God, I could feel the authenticity, not just from you, but Minnie was standing next to me. And I could feel her soul radiating when you were talking mm. about Lester. Okay. Yeah, she, so to the, to, to the idiots on the comment section who think it was all theatrics, I was there in person. I felt it. And, I, and it was a thing that I walked away with going, holy cow, this company actually cares mm -hmm. about their employees. And that is yeah, so rare <laughs> today. It's so rare. So yeah, and I, I wanted to make a video and I was afraid you guys would get mad about me taking that video. I, I didn't ask for permission, yeah. uh, but I just yeah. made that video and um, I'm glad it blessed you guys. And I just want to say thank you to you for making that video. I know what goes into making a video and uh, it has touched so many people. Sometimes it's a simple thing. Um, I'll, I'll call her out because she is another wonderful. She calls me her favorite human being, but she's one of my favorite human beings is Alma from Pink Soul Studios. We were not struggling at all, but we were. There was a time, I think it was right, I forget what year it was, and she sent a simple postcard. She came to an end user class and she wanted to say thank you and thank you for, you know, this and this. And we hung that one card up on one of our big walls. And anytime Alma would come to a class, I'd introduce her to everybody and, and I'd go, that's the postcard lady. You wow. know, she is sometimes it's a simple thought, like, like Clint reaching out to you and sending you an email at 11 o'clock at night. And yeah. it's nothing to stage that all comes from our hearts. And, but some people think that, you know, and I don't know what to say to those folks. Maybe you haven't been part of a, a close knit uh, company that takes care of their employees and has respect yeah. and has gives yeah. their employees integrity or the possibility to continue their integrity. So I'm sorry it went it's this crazy. far. But I knew, well, wanted to bring that up. What's also really cool is I received a message from somebody saying, I worked there. And what you said is absolutely true. And then I got another message last week. Uh, I think I, I sent it to you. And it was uh, someone saying their wife watched that video and hates their job and just wants to like spend their days helping people. And so she's applied for f at, f at your at. Festival HQ. No way. Yeah. Because from the, like, she's like, I hate my job. I want to go do that. I want to be a part of that company. Yeah. So. Hey, make, and you make, sent, make, you, you sent me a video because somebody saw the video. Was it you who sent the video about Minnie's, somebody that Minnie knew Minnie's husband? Was that you? Uh, yeah. It was a mess. Uh, it was a, a message that someone sent yeah. me. And many, when Minnie said it was you, she said the same. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, she's she's the best. OK, Drew, I think we've set a new shop talk record. Right, unit. OK, uh, sometimes I knew this was going to run long and uh, we didn't cover everything, but I, I'm real respectful of time for you. Oh, I want to say thank you. We'll continue this on another shop talk. I guarantee it. Um, did you get all your words in? I need, you know, I don't want to be a velociraptor, but here I just, I need to say thank you because uh, how that's a velociraptor, I don't know, but someone wanted me to say that. <laughs> um, when I started this journey in the content creation, I made a list of like dream things that would, could happen. And I wrote some brands that I love that I'd love to work with. And I never even allowed myself to dream of one day working with Festool because I thought, Y'all are too good and I'm not good enough. 
And uh, the idea that I get to partner with you guys and even get to know you and to be a part of this, it just blows my, like I, it's going to take me a while to process that a year ago, I cold emailed you asking you a question. And then now I'm on this with you. Uh, and it, it just, what a testament it is to just be courageous and don't be afraid to dream. And in my case, I haven't dreamed big enough because I, I didn't think this would ever be possible. Um, and so I, I need to dream bigger, but uh, man, I'm, to me, it's a humble honor highlight of the day when we have dinner with the kids and we share our highs and lows, my high will be that I got to spend, you know, some time with you today. And, uh, it'll teach Same. my, kids, it'll teach my kids the, the, you know, the, the importance of, you know, when you work hard and you help people, cool stuff happens. Cool stuff happens when you work hard and help people. And Drew, I'm, I'm not, not to get sappy because we're going to end this, but I just want to tell you, I'm honored personally to have gained a new awesome friend. Oh, well, thank you. Same here. Okay. Everybody. This was episode number 25. I still got to do a, uh, an opening now with you after unit. Okay. Hey, um, Drew, thank you for your time. Uh, Chris is going to stop this here in a few seconds. That was Festival Shop Talk number 25.